All right, so the, the second paper is uh, by Jonas um, from SAP Security Research, and he's going to tell us how to collaboratively compute median um, without um, spending so much computation. Thank you very much. So this is a joint work with Professor Florian Cashbaum from the University of Waterloo, and the project was funded by the H2020 uh, UA project, uh, project Mosaic Crown. So the goal of this talk will be to explain the title of the paper and what we are doing. So first, short motivation. The idea is we want to compute um, collaborative statistics in a distributed manner. So we have the term distributed private learning, and the idea is we have parties with confidential data who want to learn or want to compute uh, statistics over their joint data, over their combined data, while preserving the privacy of all the elements contained in this data. There are different real-world examples for this. Um, one, for example, is ad conversion to link online ads with offline purchases. So after you click on this ad, you cannot easily track um, who buys something offline. But Google MasterCard reportedly to Bloomberg articles um, are working together to do just that. And there's also tax fraud detection from Cybernetica, ShareMind, you probably know them. The Estonian Tax and Customs Boards and different companies work together to detect tax fraud. And there are different studies to find correlation between the time you take um, or it requires for you to finish your studies and if you are a working student. So the Estonian Ministry of Education and Research and the Customs Board work together on that one. And there's also work on the greater Boston area to find wage disparities and wage gaps, and it's really interesting. And we will focus on two semi-honest parties computing rank-based statistics, especially the median. So semi-honest in this context means uh, the parties can be trusted to perform the computation, they will not deviate from the protocol, and they will do as they are told. And this is a realistic setting, as we think, as you can see with the real-world examples which also operate in this setting. So, before we can start and tell you how we compute rank-based statistics, we first have to explain what it even is. So the rank of a value with regard to a data set is basically the first position of this value in the sorted data, if you use zero indexing. So if you have this data set with, uh, data set with the uh, Fibonacci numbers, we can see that the first rank is zero. There's no element smaller than the first element, and the rank of the next element, one, is one, and there's a duplicate, so both of them have rank one. So it's pretty straightforward. If you have unique data, it's basically just the index in the data set. So why are we considering rank-based statistics? Because they're versatile and can be robust. They're really interesting. So this can be the mean at a minimum value, can be the maximum value. It can be, in general, any k-franked element, hence the name, uh, also called p percentile. So one special value is the median which is the 50th percentile. And it's really interesting because um, it's considered a typical value in the data set. So it is also more robust to outliers. With, with what that means, I will show with you a simple example. So if we consider the income in uh, Medina, Washington, and we look at the median income of this place with around 3,000 uh, inhabitants, then it's 168,000. But the average income is much more than one billion, which seems really strange, but then there are outliers in the data set called Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. So they skew the results significantly. That's why you mostly see median income in statistics. So we will also use differential privacy and secure computation. Why are we doing that? Well, if we just compute uh, the median, even if we do it securely and I'll just output the median, it is still one concrete value from the data set. It is one element we pick out of the data set. As you see, it's just rank-based statistics, one element, and there's no protection for it. So if it's um, some kind of confidential value or it's maybe some salary data and it can actually be linked back to you, we don't want that. So there's no protection, not even like some kind of aggregation like with the mean. Um, we want some kind of privacy guarantee. And apps on digital privacy is a great privacy guarantee. It's used by Google for the um, Chrome browser user statistics. It's used by Microsoft for telemetry data to collect them privately, and by Apple for emojis. At least, it's for predictive text and text suggestions, but the white papers mostly mention emojis. And the idea is 
I'm just gonna give a rough informal description. Differential privacy restricts or bounds the output differences when the input changes in one element. When the input change in one element, it's also considered to be a neighbor, so different data sets, uh, the data sets that are exactly the same, exactly differ in one record are considered neighbors. And if we use that as the input for some computation, the output should not change too much. It, can, it should change somewhat, otherwise we cannot perform statistics. If a change in one person does not alter anything in the computation, then 10 people, 100 people will not change it and we do cannot perform statistics. But we can bound the privacy loss. And that's a really cool a privacy guarantee. And there are different implementation models. So roughly with a trusted third party for better accuracy or without a trusted third party for better privacy. Just rough overview. Um, we are greedy, we want both. We want high accuracy without a trusted third party and that's why we use security computation. As mentioned before by the previous speaker, the idea is it simulates a trusted third party with cryptography and that's what we're doing here. So the different techniques to implement the future privacy. Not only different models, but also different techniques. And we will be using the exponential mechanism. And it is one of these two techniques. The first one is additive noise. So the idea is basically the so-called Laplace mechanism. Um, in our case, we compute the median, and then we add noise to that value, and then release it. However, we have to carefully select the noise. The first approaches where you're using noise that was uh, basically the scale of the entire data domain. So the largest possible element or the smallest possible element because the median could be in any of those, uh, in, the, in the entire range. And then if you add noise, which is as large as that to the result, it's meaningless. So there's a great work by Nissen et al for uh, reducing that noise called smooth sensitivity. They analyze the data to reduce that noise and it's also really cool. And the computation time for this reduced noise is linear size of the uh, data. And we'll be using the exponential mechanism, which is probabilistic selection. So the idea is we compute a selection probability for each and every element of the entire data domain. And it's roughly, if you select one element m, it should be output with probability proportional to e to the power of epsilon times um, the utility function divided by some sensitivity value. The sensitivity value is not of much interest in this case to us because we can uh, basically remove it. Um, I refer to paper for details, but the, the utility function is interesting. So it scores, in our case, the closest to the median. So the median value in the data set has the highest score and the values uh, to the side of it in a sorted data set have lower scores and therefore we can select them uh, accordingly. So higher score means higher probability to be selected. The exponential mechanism is a bit more complicated to be computed. Um, it's linear the size of the data domain. However, we still use it because it can achieve high accuracy even for low epsilon. And this is what we'll try to show you with those little um, graphs here on the side. Those are two data sets. One is credit card data set on the left and this one is Walmart shipping weights. The idea is here we're using really low epsilon of 0 0.1 and we can see that the average absolute error about 100 runs um, is much lower for low epsilon compared to smooth sensitivity. This is our reason for using the exponential mechanism, even though it's more complicated. But um, we will show a way to perform the computation in sublinear time to achieve great efficiency and still high accuracy. So um, we talked about different privacy, but we still have to talk a little bit about secure computation. How do we do that? Um, well, there are two main techniques, two main paradigms to perform secure computation. One is secret chain by Shamir. Um, the idea is it is efficient for arithmetic computation. You can imagine this like computing on a random value and the actual value with this added randomness, then you can perform efficient arithmetics and combine them and learn the actual result. It's really cool. Um, we use it for add addition, subtraction, and scalar multiplication. So multiplication with a known value. If the value is secret, we uh, there's some tricks with b triples and stuff you have to do. Um, and there's also garbled circuits as the other paradigm. It's more efficient for building computations or computations on bits, and it's more interesting for um, comparisons. You can think of it as a doubly symmetric encrypted, encrypted truth table, if you will. And we want to use both. 
because we want to have efficient addition subtraction and efficient comparison. So we implement uh, our protocol with ABY, uh, which is from Demler, uh, Schneider, and Zona, an NDS 2015 paper. And it provides two party computation with secret sharing and garbled circuits and provides conversion between those two techniques. Okay. Now, after talking about the ingredients, we can get cooking. Now we can actually perform the secure exponential mechanism for the median. As a little reminder, the exponential mechanism outputs an element from the domain with probability proportional to E, um, evaluated for some epsilon and some utility value. Running time is linear in the size of the data domain, and we have to use costly secure exponentiation if we do it straightforwardly. So how do we change it? Um, well, if you have a large data domain, we use sorted data instead. As I mentioned in the beginning, rank-based statistics, if the data is unique and sorted, the rank is basically just the index and the sorted data. So we use that. And then we can use uh, this to have a data-independent utility score, which is great. And we can also extend it to non-unique data and to actually to the entire data domain by including the minimum and maximum value that could ever be in a data domain. Um, but what about large data? So we changed it from large data domain to a large data size. Well, then we prune the data. We use iterative pruning, which preserves the meaning by Agarwa and Mishra Pinkers, um, which requires a slight relaxation of digital privacy uh, called prune neighborings. The details are in the paper. We now require to uh, have an additional restriction that the output of our function for the pruning steps should be the same for those neighboring data sets. And we provide empirical evaluation that this is not such a great restriction or not too problematic, but it changes the group privacy uh, or limits it somewhat. Also, details on the paper. And what about cost to secure exponentiation? Well, we don't need it. We just don't have to do it anymore because we have a data independent utility function now. Therefore, our exponentiation is also data independent and we can get away without doing it. Epsilon is a privacy parameter that is public. Uh, the utility value is known and it is data independent. Therefore, we are uh, here. Uh, you don't need to costly compute it securely. So to give you a rough step-by-step -step overview of the protocol, if parties A and B with sorted data, uh, both parties um, compute in the first step uh, the pruning. So the idea is they compute their median values, their local own median values. Then the input to, to a CQ comparison uh, implemented with garbled circuits, and then receive just a zero or one bit is my value larger than the others or not? And they can use that to discard half of the data. For details, I refer to the Agam uh, Pinker's paper. Uh, the idea here is by doing that, we can maintain the mutual median, even though we discard data from each party. But the median of both parties combined will still be maintained. And we do this a couple of times until we reach uh, a desired size or until we hit a limit. Uh, for the privacy value, which is also in the paper. And then in the next step, we merge the data. The data is already pre-sorted. So we do not sort it, but we can use oblivious merging with platonic uh, mergers by he and Evans and all. And then we secret share that result as it provides um, more efficient means to do uh, arithmetic, which is the main part because now we can actually compute the selection probabilities. This is the main part we wanted to do. Recall, the exponential mechanism provides uh, selection probabilities for each and every element, and so the main task is to compute those selection probabilities. And what we're doing here is we compute, we call it mass, it's basically the sum over all uh, the, let's call it weights, the exponential function evaluated for our data independent utility function, and our uh, epsilon parameter, which we can compute without access to the data because it's data independent. Then we compute gap over the secret shared data simply by using the distances between neighboring values, adjacent values which are closer to the median. So either if you consider element at position E, you will use the predecessor or successor depending on whatever is closer to the median. Uh, we do this because it gives us the count of consecutive elements with the same utility. So if you consider to you compute something like the cumulative density function, which we're actually doing here implicitly, 
uh, we want to have uh, the utility for all elements that are, uh, or the number of elements that have the same utility. So we can have compute the mass for the probability mass for those elements. And the nice thing here is we can compute this overall of the secret shares by simply using the data event function, then using this, uh, computing this over the secret shares. And this provides a really efficient uh, way to compute this. Hence, we do all this stuff beforehand. And in the last step, we simply input what we computed over the secret shares to a garbled circuit again, because we now require comparisons again, which is easier to uh, be implemented or more efficiently implemented with uh, garbled circuits. And we select the output via uh, the previously computed cumulative density function. So that's a lot. It's a rough overview. But I think you might get the idea. So let's go to the evaluation. This is meaningful. So here, um, we evaluated it on different uh, AWS regions. Uh, it runs in seconds for millions of records with real-world latency on TE2 medium instances, 2 GB RAM, and for virtual CPUs. We have two versions of our protocol, one using only garbled circuits and one using garbled circuits as well as secret chain to show that there's actually a benefit of using uh, the hybrid approach, even though there's um, a lot of uh, conversion between those. I'm just going to quickly highlight the last picture here. We have we had highest latency of 100, 100 milliseconds and 100 Mbits uh, bandwidth only. And we still achieve less than uh, seven seconds for our highest evaluated pr uh, privacy value for a data size of millions of records on each size. So this is really fast. And now we can come to the conclusion. Recall the papers. Uh, named Secure Supply and Time Digital Private Median Computation, which is a mouthful. And we said we're going to use median computation because we're interested in rank-based statistics, and this is a really nice example for it. We, our paper is also extensible to any kind of rank-based statistics, um, which are versatile and robust. We're going to we use digital privacy because it's a really strong privacy guarantee as used by the industry. We implemented with the exponential mechanism for high privacy, even though we use a low epsilon value. And we highlighted supply time in the um, paper title because normally the exponential mechanism is linear in the time. And we provide a supply time um, execution. And we also put secure in the title because it's a secure computation. We provide an efficient implementation without a trusted third party. So they, those are the main points. High accuracy, low epsilon, no trusted third party. Thank you. <laughs> Great talk. So we have uh, time for questions. There's one question in the back. Hi, um, Hassan from Macquarie University. I've got a couple of questions. First one is the domain size. Uh, do you compute that um, privately or you consider that as something that known already? And the second question is, why did you limit yourself to two parties only? Is that because of garbled circuits or? Uh, Thank you. The first part of the question, the domain size, we consider to be known. There's actually work by Dwork and Lee which say we do not uh, require to have the universe size or the domain size to be known beforehand. And it's a great, interesting uh, work. But as soon as you do that, you have to consider statistical settings. And there's a, you need much more samples, I think. At least that's what they're doing. Um, so we said it's publicly known. We think it's maybe like the integer range, so the number of all possible integers. This is our universe size. Um, and the second part of the question, two parties. Um, it's a good question. Um, yeah, we consider two parties mainly because um, the garbled circuit approach initially, although there is other work where you can you expand it to multiple parties. And also because the uh, pruning we are using here um, it, by Agarwal, Mishra, and Pinkas, they also have a setting for two parties and for multiple parties, and the two-party uh, version is a logarithmic in the size of the data, which we wanted to have. So those are the main reasons. Garbled circuits and because of the other paper we use as our basis for the pruning. So we have time for one more question, perhaps? Maybe I'll ask a question. Um, so in federated learning, um, there's different algorithms for um, kind of aggregating the model mm -hmm. parameters. And one of the 
uh, perhaps the most basic ones and uh, most, I guess, fundamental ones is using, med using Median. Mm. Um, but then it's known to be leaking private information, right? So it's, that's why people are working on designing better aggregation algorithms. So have you thought about applying your technique um, in federated learning for computing Median? This is actually something we trying to think about right now. So it's still in the working phase, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're thinking about it, but if you have any input, I'm glad to steal your ideas. Absolutely. All right, so let's thank uh, Jonas one more time. Yeah.